UFC 300 just wrapped up the other night and I'm gonna be breaking down the whole card, just reacting to every single fight, all the crazy moments. It was the best card that I've ever seen live in my life, which is pretty sick. Um, honestly, everything went pretty according to plan, except for, you know, a couple of things, which, which we'll get to. And just real quickly, we'll flash my record on the screen real quick. This is my record across the year so far on pay-per-views. Like I've said on all of my pay-per-view predictions, I usually do decent. I got the main event correct, went nine and four. I really was riding with a lot of underdogs. I got like most of my losses were underdog picks. I think all of them were underdog picks. So I could have played it a little bit safer, but you know what? It's the nature of the game. I had to ride with people like Charles Oliveira and a couple of other fighters. But let's just get right into the card. I know it's a Monday now. I, I had to wait a whole day because my adrenaline dump that I had from the Max Holloway fight really seeped into my Sunday. Like I just, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you can relate. I was at many points in the day, kind of just taken aback, staring, blanking off, thinking like, wow, Max Holloway is him. Like that shit is crazy. But let's get into the main event. Alex Pereira defeated Jamal Hill in the first round in like three minutes with a left hook knockout. And he also had an I'm him moment himself. It obviously didn't compare to Max Holloway because Max Holloway had the moment of like the century, but it was still pretty fucking badass because he got kicked in the cup right before the sequence where he knocked out Jamal Hill happened. And Herb Dean tried to step in and Alex Pereira was just like, not even looking at him, just put his hand there like, let me cook. And boom, throws a left hook. And at the same time, all my homies were at my house. And he was, he was riding with Jamal Hill and he was talking about, oh, Jamal's a southpaw, so the leg kicks aren't gonna be as strong. And right before he got hit with the left, with the left hook, I was telling him, right, those leg kicks aren't gonna be as good, but that left hook is right there all day for Pereira. If Hill can't, you know, land those straight, straight shots, like right down the pipe before he does it. And lo and behold, Alex Pereira does it, it like 20 seconds after that. Does the Kabi Lame fucking, you know, that bullshit. And it's getting memed everywhere. That was honestly what I expected to happen. I mean, I just, like I said in my prediction video, I'm not gonna side against Alex Pereira unless he's taken on like Israel Adesanya again. And it's not because I'm an Izzy meat rider. It's, it's straight up just because that's clearly the only person that can handle Pereira. I mean, look at everybody else he's fought since Izzy. That's the only person that's taken him to five rounds and then knocked him out. That's it, cut and dry. And it seems like nobody else can handle that style of kickboxing and that frame and that power. They, I don't know what it is. He just has, you know, legitimate hands of stone, uh, power from God. And that man is one of, already like has one of the most impactful careers in MMA, point blank period. I just saw a forum pop up on my phone like 10 minutes ago for uh, whether or not Alex Pereira has passed Khabib in the GOAT conversation. I'm saying, yeah, I mean, straight up, what did Khabib do that compared to this? Bro, he's already fought more times than Khabib did probably in his whole career in just the last couple of months. Like, let's be real. I know that's not for real, but he's damn, he's actually inching pretty close to how many fights Khabib had in total in the UFC. So shout out Alex Pereira, shout out Jamal Hill, because coming back from that type of layoff and the injury he had, he really did seem the most confident. And I, I was a little bit nervous about that. I'm sure he's gonna bounce back well. He's still one of the top light heavyweights in the world. His performance over Glover is still one of the like best masterclasses in a title fight that an underdog's ever had. So you can't count him out. And then we had Wei Li Zhang taking on Yan Jianan. This was a good fight. Uh, Wei Li subbed her, knocked her out, and then submitted her again, which is crazy. I got to see all of that in one fight. And she also had some adversity. She got dropped twice. Although I wouldn't call them like super, I mean, they were knockdowns, but they're not like, you know, she got stunned bad and then she drops. It was more like she was throwing kicks and they were getting timed really well by Yan Chaonan. Ultimately, it ends up going to a decision, but it should have been a submission. I called for a submission on Verdict. I called for a fucking submission on Vivada. And you know, the refs just wanted to see murder, I guess. There's not too much to say about this fight. I mean, Wei Li is just a freak of nature. She's one of the best talents in the sport. Like I've been saying, like everybody says, you know, she's just probably the best female fighter on the planet right now, excluding maybe Valentina Shevchenko, who I think is getting a little bit up there in age. So I really do think it's Wei Li all day and I can't wait to see her next fight. I hope it is moving up in weight and taking on Grosso Shevchenko winner because I just want to see a real challenge for this girl. And then we had the fight that has me sapped, bro. Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway for the BMF title. Oh, where do I even begin? Oh, Max, where do I even begin? Max Holloway, for one, underdog pick, which is reasonable. I know we all kind of expected 
Justin Gaethje might be able to Tony Ferguson, Max Holloway. I w I've seen him do it before to my beloved Tony. I really thought he might do it to Max. But over the course of the week, before my prediction video, I switched and I was like, you know what? It's Blessed Express. And that's why I predicted Max Holloway. I thought he was going to surprise everybody and beat Justin over a unanimous decision, maybe drop a round or two and just kind of, you know, melt Justin with pressure. And that's pretty much what he was doing. Justin Gaethje was playing the land one, two game and he was whipping some pretty hard leg kicks, which to give Max credit, most people don't eat them the same way. Most people aren't just walking fine. Max really is just a badass dude. But um, yeah, Justin Gaethje was really only going for that. And Max Holloway was, you know, obviously Max Holloway is gonna beat somebody that's only going for one, two, two strike combinations. It's just not enough, you feel me? And Max Holloway was fading in and out of the pocket beautifully like he does against everybody. He was hurting Gaethje at multiple different points in the fight. There was a point where Justin actually like had Max in some adversity in the fourth round. He actually landed the first knockdown anybody's ever landed on Max, which is wild. It just adds to the whole like experience of the fight. But Max really quickly got his bearings, his bearings back. He wasn't hurt too bad or anything and, you know, continued to fire off on Justin for the rest of the round. The fifth round was going perfectly for Max. He was really honestly just up four to one. Um, on, you could even argue five oh, like even the round he got knocked down, he was still kind of putting the work on Justin. But I just feel like, you know, Justin did make it a bit too close. But then, yeah, you know, in the fifth round, Max is just melting him, clearly could win the fight. And in the last 10 seconds, he does his iconic, let's go in the center and just scrap toe to toe and did oh boy did they he says he's gonna do that with justin gaethje bro that's so crazy he's a madman you could throw away the fight like that trying to do that shit with justin gaethje he didn't give a fuck and it paid off beautifully because in the last second of a five round war it was already fight of the night in the last second of this fight he lands to the body to the body boom with an overhand or a straight or a, i don't even know what it was justin gaethje face plants Max Holloway knocks out Justin Gaethje in the last second of the fifth round, a buzzer beater. My whole house lost their shit. It was so cool seeing the reactions of everybody in the crowd, everybody at home, if you've seen that compilation of just everybody's reactions to that shit. Dude, we were all feeling the same thing at the same time. Absolute chaos. To do that to Justin Gaethje, when everyone says you have pillow hands, bro, and for all my, for all my homies that be playing UFC 5, Max Holloway five stars is coming back to the game. Like, I hope you guys are ready to face that every single match online in featherweight and lightweight now. It's gonna be cracked. Max Holloway is just, like how many times is he gonna have performances like this? The Chan Sung Jung one shot knockout, obviously Korean Zombie's old, but like that was still pretty fucking cool because we don't see him do that often. The Brian Ortega performance, just an absolute masterclass. The Calvin Cater performance, even better than the Brian Ortega performance. The Arnold Allen performance, bro. Arnold Allen hadn't lost to anybody yet. Like, you just go down the list. Max Holloway is ridiculous. He's the only person I, th I can think of off top that's fought Justin, Dustin, and Conor McGregor, and Volkanovski. Yeah, like, and Charles Oliveira. Like, oh my gosh. I could just go on glazing Max forever. So I'm just gonna end this part of the video by saying shout out Blessed Express. Shout out Justin Gaethje as well. You can't not love either of these fighters. They're both goats. But Max Holloway's legend just continues to, you know, climb. And now he set himself up for even bigger opportunities, dude. <sighs> Can't wait. Then we had Charles Oliveira versus Armin Saryukin. It's crazy that we're following all of this up with Charles Oliveira, bro. And he looked like vintage Charles in the first round. You know, he kicks out Armin's leg, jumps his guillotine. And Armin, credit to him, survives a pretty tight guillotine. It didn't look like it was fully, fully locked in. Like, you know, the way Charles gets it on a lot of people. I feel like Armin definitely had some leeway and it made it so it was easier to push through. But either way, he had to fight through some adversity in the first round. Drops the first round of Charles, comes back in the second with ground and pound, uh, elbows primarily, busted up Charles' face a bit. So he takes that round, now it's 1-1. Now here's where the controversy lies. Charles Oliveira gets taken down pretty early in the, the third round and Armin doesn't really do anything with it. No ground and pound shots, to my knowledge. I don't remember him landing much of anything at all. But then... Charles Oliveira jumps, ah, fuck, I don't even remember what it was. He gets, a, he ends up getting another like, not a fully deep submission, but he gets Armin in like a darts or something, something along those lines. And that like goes for a good bit of the round and it kind of just like ends with them in that type of a scramble. Armin, you know, out wrestling, uh, Charles having better Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and it's kind of just a stalemate. 
I personally thought the submission threat was more than Armin just holding him in the third round. But I also understood that the, the judges could very easily give it to Armin. And I wasn't going to be too mad. I definitely feel like I wish that fight was five rounds like I thought it was. I said in my prediction it was five rounds because the whole time, I swear I was reading somewhere that that was a five round fight. But it wasn't and that was disappointing. I feel like if it was five rounds, it could have been a lot closer but I'll, then again armin's gas tank you know he's never shown to have a, a bad gas tank so who knows i mean either way it shows me that islam probably is gonna wash both of these people like regardless and I'm, I'm a huge charles fan like honestly i was going so hard for him back when he did fight islam but realistically i just i feel like islam's positional control and his pressure on top is too much for both these people but either way good fight and then we had the the opener. I'm not going to say too much on this. Bo Nickel gets a submission in the second round against Cody Brundage. Throws like absolutely no strikes. That would really open up, you know, the subs, Bo, if you would start throwing punches when you get these dominant positions and not just trying to hold and out, out like overpower the person until they finally fold. Because obviously somebody like Cody is going to fold. You know that. If you just start hammering his head into the canvas, he'll fold quicker. Bo Nickel could have taken taken more risks, I feel like, but overall, what are you gonna add? What more can you ask for a guy that's on his third fight in the UFC and he's only six and zero? So good shit for Cody. I mean, for Bo, Bo Nickel getting the submission, and I mean, shout out Cody Brunage. You got to be on a historic card. And then we have another. Oh my gosh, bro! It's like even just trying to talk about all of these, it's draining the fuck out of me because I'm remembering how hyped it was and how like high my blood pressure was going, bro. Yuri Prohaska versus Alexander Rakic. Safe to say I had a big bet on Yuri, and safe to say he cashed in big. Yuri gets the second round TKO, has a really rough first round, but again, it looks like a typical Yuri round. Like, he's moving weird. He's kind of, the only thing that I didn't like is his precision wasn't as on, but like, what can you expect? The guy came off of a pretty long layoff straight to an Alex Pereira fight where he didn't get much cage time. You know, I felt like that was gonna be an issue. Alexander Rakic looked like one of the best fighters in the world for a round and a half. It was crazy. Cause he also came off of probably the longest layoff out of anybody point blank period. It was like 700 days or something like that. Yuri Prohaska though, starts to find the mark in the second round, just being scrappy, keeping that pace on Rakic. Rakic is landing, don't get me wrong, he's landing bombs, but Yuri just eats them like they're nothing. And Yuri finds the shot again, kind of drags him to the canvas and TKOs and Moy's there because he was already just out of it. Shout out Yuri Prohaska, absolute warrior. He wants the title shot next. They're probably not gonna give it to him. I wouldn't mind seeing him take on, mm, why well, heavyweight's a rough one. You know, a weird fight I'd wanna see is Yuri Prohaska versus K Khalil Roundtree. Like, you know, obviously I know it doesn't make too much sense rankings wise, but hey, if you, if you know styles, you know that fight's gonna be crazy. Moving down, featherweight debut of Aljamain Sterling versus Calvin Cater. It was upsetting and both something I was glad to see because I picked Aljo and I do want to see him continue his career and maybe make a little featherweight run. Where I was disappointed is because Calvin Cater for a long time was one of my like top three favorites at featherweight. I just really like his style. I like a boxing heavy style and he's a dog with a, with a pretty good gas tank. But his problem is the wrestling and like usually he can't get taken down the way that Aljamain's doing that. Maybe if he wasn't so gun shy, maybe if he remembered how to throw a punch, it wouldn't have been that bad. But yeah, Aljamain Sterling becomes the first man in history to take Calvin Cater down more than once in a fight, which is ridiculous because he's taken on Zabit. Aljamain Sterling is just, you know, clearly up there when it, when it comes to the grapplers in the sport. And I've always kind of known that, but it's really showing. I can't wait to see him move up. You know, that automatically shoots him up into the top 10 of featherweight. Let's see him take on the likes of like, I don't know. What's a dangerous matchup for Aljamain Sterling at featherweight? Hmm. I don't even know right now. Maybe a Josh Emmett. I think he's already matched up with somebody though. That'd be a good fight though. Like just based on the build, I could see Josh Emmett landing big on Aljo and I could see Aljo having an easy time, you know, like out grappling somebody that, that is that small and like closer to his stature for, fe for a featherweight. Then we have Kayla Harrison going down the card, taking on Holly Holm, took on Holly Holm. And I'm impressed. I told you guys in my video, if she can get a finish on Holly Holm, I'm going to be impressed. She impressed me. She somehow kept the momentum up the card and Aljamain was the one to ruin it. No offense, Aljo, but like, it's the, it's the truth of the matter. Kayla Harrison absolutely bullied Holly Holm, who is again, 42. So, you know, we can't be too hard on her. Kayla Harrison is in her prime, 33 years old. And she looked like Michael Chandler every time that I saw her back. Um, she was just, again, taking Holly Holm down at will. Holly Holm did reverse the first, uh, like, judo clinch toss she tried to throw on her, which is pretty cool. It had me a little nervous, like, shit, maybe Holly really is that that dude. 
I mean, that that, that girl, I'm sorry. But um, they both kind of looked like dudes that, that night. But no, nah, for real, Kayla Harrison just bullied her, got her down, ended up finding the, the rear naked choke in the second round. And she tapped in like a couple of seconds, like immediately after that choke was put in. So that shows me Kayla Harrison has that Michael Chandler sweet squeeze. Honestly, throw her in there for the title fight. Like, let's get Raquel Pennington out of there. Let's be real. She's not gonna, I don't think she's gonna beat Kayla Harrison. That'd be a note, that would add to Raquel's legacy, honestly, if she could get that one done. Cause she's gonna be a big underdog. Then we have the end of the prelims or the, the, the beginning of the prelims, sorry, we're going backwards. Sadiq Yusuf and Diego Lopez, wow. I picked Sadiq y Yusuf. I thought he was just gonna be too technical, too, too experienced for somebody like Diego Lopez. And I was so wrong. I mean, obviously he has double the fights, so I didn't mean like too experienced, but UFC caliber opponents, Sadiq had the edge. Diego Lopez has wicked power. And honestly, the more I think about it, when he was in the cage, his build is massive for a featherweight at 5'11". The second they get in the clinch, he lands like a short uppercut, and that almost knocks Sadiq out alone. Sadiq survives for a bit because, you know, his chin's not the best, but he is he still has heart, and he still does have, a, like, a decent chin. He took a pretty big crack, but Diego just kept landing on him, drops him again, ends the fight in the first round, pretty much in, like, the first minute and a half. <laughs> really disappointing, but also kind of hype because Diego Lopez, like I've been saying, if you're an NFL fan, he's like the Puka Nakua of our sport. This man is honestly like the prospect to look at and i can't wait to see him move up the featherweight rankings now i hope they give him you know what maybe diego lopez versus Algerman sterling that'd be a crazy fight i mean i don't want that just because i don't i want both of them to keep rising but hey if you really if we really got to see Algerman get fed to the wolves give him diego and then we move down the prelims jalen turner versus hanato moicano money money moicano baby Cashed me in on a plus 200 underdog, and I'm sure a lot of you that trusted the money. But hey, let's be real, a lot of you guys didn't trust the money because Jalen Turner was a two to one favorite and he stayed like that. Jalen Turner proved why, because in the first round he almost, you know, walk off knocked out Hanato, but that was his that was his biggest mistake ever, and it cost him bad. He tried to walk off, didn't finish the fight. He allowed Hanato to get his bearings back a little bit. And then Hanato comes back in the second round, finds the takedowns again, and just drowns out Jalen Turner with a TKO. Just you know, couldn't do anything positionally against somebody like Hanato. It's what I expected to happen, although I thought it was going to be a submission. Either way, cashes in on a huge underdog, and I couldn't be happier. Hanato Moicano moves up the lightweight rankings. Let's give him, I don't know, let's give him a fun fight. Let's give him somebody that's not so dangerous on the feet, maybe. And then, well, everybody is at lightweight, though. You know what? Let's give him Mateus. That's a good fight. <laughs> then moving down, Jessica Andrade taking on, or took on Marina Rodriguez. I'm gonna be honest, I thought Marina took this one, although they both looked sloppy. And Jessica, you know, honestly, like when you look at it, her big moment in the first round was Marina slipping and like kind of just not getting off of her ass. And then in the second round, she's winning the whole fucking fight, the whole round. And then in like the last minute, Jessica kind of lands on her against the cage. And then in the third round, again, like Marina is like honestly just outboxing her pretty much the whole round. Jessica has slight moments and that's it. I felt like Marina won at least 12, 13 minutes of the fight or like 11, 12 minutes of the fight. Let's let's call it that. But they gave it to Jessica Andrade. I mean, it is what it is. It was an underdog pick, although I thought it was weird that she was an underdog. It is what it is, weird judging on that one, I feel like. We had Bobby Green and Jim Miller. Jim Miller, I trusted him. I thought there was gonna be some UFC 300 magic for my boy and it looked like it in the first round. <laughs> But Bobby Green just absolutely teed off on Jim Miller and it got violent. It was so bloody. He's beating the dog piss out of him. Shout out Bobby Green. Not much to say on it. I mean, he just kind of worked him bad, especially after the second round. It just got really bad. Then we had the opener, two champions taking each other on, former champions. I mean, Davidson Figueredo taking on Cody Garbrandt. Cody looked vintage in the first round. He looked fast. I was honestly nervous for my pick. I picked Davidson by a first round finish. I thought it was gonna be a submission. But Davison ends up finding his clinch and uh, or his takedown from the clinch, I believe. Or he found like a really slick takedown where he dragged Cody and he ends up keeping him there. Cody couldn't get that one explosive movement to like, you know, get out, which is what he's good at. And Davison keeps it on him, ends up finding the rear naked choke in like the end of the second round. Davison opens the night up. With another big win at Bantamweight. He's 2-0 at Bantamweight and he's looking pretty solid. So overall, UFC 300, it delivered in my opinion. Clear fight of the night was Max Holloway and Justin Gaethje and clear knockout of the night. It was just the biggest moment of the whole card. It's something everybody's gonna be talking about for the rest of the year. Like, I can't think of a moment being bigger than that.
And if there is one, wow, we have a lot to look forward to. Uh, let me know what you guys think thought below of this card. Um, ultimately, I'm just low-key depressed that we get no fights for the next week. I mean, I think I need that. I need my fucking time to just sit with this one. But, like, what can even just... Like, 301 is nothing compared to this now. These, like, fight nights aren't going to feel like anything now, you know? Like, it's just... It's rough, bro, but... It is what it is. This is the life of a fight fan. That was really fucking cool at the end of the day. Shout out Max Holloway. And shout out you guys for checking out my content. I will catch y'all.